Hello. Today is Friday, January 7th, 2022. My name is Colin Goldberg, and I'm here today with artist Victor Acevedo. Um, so welcome, Victor. Um, thanks for um, joining me today. And uh, it's a pleasure to um, be able to wrap with you a little bit about your art and your practice. You know, we've gotten to know each other a little bit, you know, over the course of the various expressionism salons and things like that, but I'm interested to um, learn a little bit more about your background. I know we shared some, um, we both lived in New York, or maybe around the same time period or so. And, uh, you know, I've seen uh, a bunch of your work and very interested in, in learning more about it. Um, so, um, you know, I guess, you know, oh. the, the first question that we'll, we'll, we'll start with is, um, you know, could you tell us uh, a little bit about your background, like, you know, where you were born, where you live and practice now, and then, you know, also, you know, your cultural influences as an artist. Sure. Yeah. Well, I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California, uh, and I was there for about 21 years, and then I moved away to Albuquerque, New Mexico for a couple of years, and then uh, I moved back to L.A. So I've mostly been in Los Angeles most of my life, but I did move to New York in 1995. Uh, was there for about 14 years. So that was a great adventure. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, I was there from like 94 to 2000. So we definitely were there at the same time. Um, whereabouts yeah. in the city were you? Well, I was in various places. I jumped around a lot. You know, when I first landed, I was on uh, in uh, Murray Hill, 34th and 1st Avenue. There was a, the Rivergate Apartments there because I, I got a job at the same time when I moved there. So uh, there was some housing uh provided for me at first and so nice. I was living there and then I, I moved I lived in Chelsea for a while on West 28th Street near FIT uh, and then I lived for a while on Park Avenue third and Park that was a short time and then uh, longer I ended up in the East Village because I had some old friends there which was on Avenue A uh, when were you in the East Village I, I was I have to think uh, I think it was uh uh, maybe 97, 97 to about 2000, something That's like that. That's very weird. We probably, <laughs> I was on A and second at that time, actually. Um, I lived on oh. second and second and then on A and second, um, right near well, that gracefully, uh, the Grace Deli market there on A and second, like the next building. I was oh, on 20 yeah. Avenue A. So um, oh, from well, like 96 to 2000. Like that. okay who we probably cross paths you know without <laughs> even knowing it but, you uh, know, a few times did you go to life cafe i did yeah yeah and then there was that place um there was a place called uh, the Corova milk bar i don't know if you ever went oh, there yeah. that was on i a. went there that was a few like times exactly like the clockwork orange um milk bar you know they oh yeah exactly like yeah yeah uh -huh. i totally these burritos and all that yeah oh yeah I'm that sure was nearby there crossed crossed paths probably multiple times yeah it's funny i didn't realize you lived right there um at during that same time period that's interesting yeah 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 that's wild good synchronicity um mm -hmm. and then later i moved to greenpoint like uh that was about 2000 i moved to greenpoint and then after that i went to williamsburg went okay to williamsburg. yeah I, st I started in williamsburg in 94 i was at broadway in bedford and lived there briefly um actually got mugged oh. uh, shortly after moving there, coming back from a temp job underneath the the bridge. And then I was like, you know what, like maybe I'm going to jump across the river and, and see what I could find there. So I moved into a tiny flat in a uh, second and second, but um, it was an old building across from that bank building right near Peter Luger's. Um, it was still kind of uh, pretty non-gentrified at that point. There's a chop shop on the corner and stuff. And, uh, yeah. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, I have, uh, you know, my memories are fading, but I'm, I totally uh, know that like second, you said second and second Avenue and second street. Yeah, in, in Williamsburg, I was at Broadway in Bedford. And then I moved when I moved to, to the East Village, I was on at second and second. That was the block okay. where um, the Hells Angels were down on the end of the block. Oh, yeah. There, and uh, there's a cemetery there and the film archives building was on the other end of that block. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, I remember that. Cool. Yeah, I'm getting, I'm just, I'm kind of looking at my image. It's different. I'm in a different position than where I normally am. So it looks odd to me. I got used to, it's the first time I did, I'm sort of 
So bear with me if I seem distracted. I'm not used to this. <laughs> it's all good. I see my it, my cat Julie is like r- roaming around in the background there. Okay, that's that's cool. <laughs> Yeah, so it's fascinating, fascinating synchronicities. And I think I met, it was fascinating to, to bump into Patrick right before we started our session, because I, I know I met Patrick uh, probably in the uh, in the late 90s, because we had some mutual friends, a, la- a lady called Arlene Schloss, who was pretty famous in the 70s and 80s as a performance artist. And hmm. he was friends with her. So I think I met him through her. Yeah, I know he was involved with Fluxus. Um, I don't know too many of the details with that, but I know he was sort of involved with that group of people. Hmm. And then we, you know, we met in graduate school, actually, um, at Bowling Green out in Ohio. And we both studied with Greg Little um, over there and hmm. did our MFAs in computer art together. That was around 2005, 2006 kind of time period so yeah um, cool when i started getting this project going you know i was like i should give patrick a call so he was one of the original people who came you know we came together in our first salon it was like me him steve miller um this woman oz van rosen who kind of was the first person that she used the term text expressionism in an article and that prompted me to say hey you know maybe there's something to this that we could get a group together so um, yeah rang, rang up patrick and i had worked for steve miller as a studio assistant many moons ago when i was an undergrad so um we've always stayed in, in contact and uh and helen harrison you know was there and helped kind of keep everything kind of consolidated she helped really formulate the definition of the term you know and um it's been a wow. really great that's advisor. great yeah yeah small world like i met uh, Steve Miller, I used to work when I was in New York at Lamont Editions, which is a mm-hmm. high end fine art uh, printing uh, facility. And uh, he came in a f- few times as a client and I worked with him one time. Yeah, he's, was- I think he still uses Lamont for um, some of the stuff he does with inkjet and he does, you know, like screen printing on top of the inkjet prints and stuff like that. Oh, okay. I've heard, him, I've heard him mention Lamont. Yeah. And I know he did it just straight print editions, but also stuff on canvas where he's screen printing on, um, you know, on the, on the inkjet pieces. Cool. Oh, cool. That's cool. Yeah. Nice. Small world, right? It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> yeah. So um, where do we, well, you asked me about oh, my background oh, yeah. so, and cultural so, yeah. influences. Cultural influences. Yeah. Uh, you know, well, it's, it's varied, you know, it's a, you know, when I hear there's a lot of layers to it, really. Uh, as you know, I, as I've mentioned, I'm born and raised in Los Angeles, so I have sort of a Los Angeles frame of mind. But the New York experience really opened up my uh, horizons in terms of, you know, how to live in an American city. Uh, you know, I, my, Acevedo is a Spanish uh, surname, so I have a Latin background, a Hispanic background, so that certainly factored in. Uh, you know, I felt the connection with my grandparents, with my maternal and paternal grandparents like that. Uh, let's see, I had some, what else did I want to say? Yeah, so there, there's that I informed it. My father uh, had natural drawing ability, natural talent. So I kind of think I inherited it from him. And uh, he became a civil engineer. Uh, so he had a kind of a math uh, tendency, tendencies towards math. Uh, but also a graphical sense and, you know, the engine, the engineering component, but he used to draw and I used to watch when I was a little kid, you know, that was a seminal influence watching him. He used to be in another side room. Mm -hmm. He'd be inking on engineering plans. And I'd be fascinating by these tools that he would use, like these compasses to make circles or draw North arrows. So, and inking on this blue vellum, you know, it was just very Mm -hmm. fascinating Mm -hmm. to see him do it. So I was thinking about that in the run up to our interviews, like, not only did I was I fascinated by pictures, but I was also got this very early sense of symbols, you know, graphical symbols that meant something or didn't. And that was uh, I think that was a seminal sort of uh, imprint uh, like that. And then uh, I had an older brother. I, I, maybe I'm jumping into another question uh, where you like, uh, okay. which, yeah, you know, like they're glomming together like uh, how did uh, let's see tell us what made you become an artist i started getting into that but it kind of it kind of evolved it was a natural thing because i had these early influences you know i started drawing at age four just spontaneously mm-hmm. uh 
in making letter forms as well. So maybe that comes with us that ex, uh, experiencing those symbols. Mm -hmm. uh, and I actually have a memory to this day of, of drawing the letter E. So I must have been four years old or five. So that's kind of interesting to have that visual imprint little mm. film playing in my head. Uh, and then later, I you know, I had a little brother, David, who's three years older than me. We were like playmates. We were really close. Uh, and uh, probably before I'm thinking of the dates, 1960, I was born in 54. So when I was five or six, our father got us this big chalkboard. We shared a bedroom and we had it on the wall. You know, it seemed really big at the time. You know, maybe it was... Uh, you know, four by six, it seemed massive at the time, but we used to wake up and dr just start drawing on this chalkboard that was right there, like at the foot of our beds. That was another like, so seminal influence, uh, you mm. know, kind of experience that sort of, uh, sort of um, nurtured this natural ability with opportunities to, to practice it, to express mm -hmm. it. So that was cool. Uh, so that was, that's interesting yeah. too. Cause I know like, like, looking you know a little bit of familiarity with work your work and i know that you've done a lot of collaborative pieces like work with photographers and other stuff like that right um so maybe yeah. like that experience of working with your brother you know both working on the same chalkboard maybe that somehow influenced you to be receptive to collaborative type experiences you know as an artist you know who knows yeah yeah exactly and i kind of went through a period of uh playing music like many of us late 60s early 70s you know starting a mm. garage band so i did that for mm. a while uh it's not my main uh, art form you know to be honest i'm not really a natural musician i have a modicum of of uh, musical ability but it kind of petered out after a while but that collaboration that was also very uh, important i think an experience in collaboration working with mm -hmm. other musicians mm -hmm. and uh and the structure of music you know we used to write write songs and things and uh but i kind of hit a dead end with that and then in in doing so that brought me back to my core talent which is as a visual artist mm -hmm. and um one of the questions is you know when did you know you wanted to be an artist and the the, the seed was planted in 1975 my father worked overseas as a civil engineer after a while. He, he uh, worked in uh, Saudi Arabia and also Bahrain. So we would have family reunions every couple of years from about 75 to 83. So in 75, when I was about 21, we, we met up in Europe. We went to various cities like Vienna, uh, Luxembourg, or, or it's hard to remember these things off the top of my head these days, just, you know, it's from the seventies, but mm. we did end up in Amsterdam, later London. We went to the North of England because he had a lot, mm. he worked with a lot of English people, engineers in, in, in the Middle East. So mm. he had this uh, connection to uh, the UK, but on the way, we we're taking this road trip from uh, Vienna to uh, Amsterdam. And then I think we flew over to London, but in Amsterdam, we went to the uh, Van Gogh Museum, and I hadn't really, 75, I hadn't really thought, well, I'm, I want to be an artist as an adult, you know, but seeing the Van Gogh uh, paintings, there was about 20 or 30 of them in this room. It's like mm. a dream image now, but I remember, I, I knew the power of music and the sound of that and that, what that could have, but I didn't really know the power of like paint coming, mm. the energy of paint coming mm -hmm. off a canvas and to be that close to these all these van gogh paintings that was kind of a you know epiphanous moment really and i mm -hmm. thought to myself it was almost a quiet you know unspoken thought to myself wow maybe you should go into visual arts and it wouldn't mm -hmm. have been in that sentence it's just like a feeling or impulse yeah right. now i get it you know it was, mm -hmm. it was very visceral yeah was, i had a similar experience with um you know the first time i ever saw a pollock in person hmm. and you know uh, prior to that i had always sort of like seen you know i was familiar with his work and seen it re in reproduction but it was always sort of like well you know what's so special about that you know what i mean until hmm. i was like standing in front of one and you know just the scale and the feeling like i was just falling into this space uh, <laughs> yeah completely changed you know the way that i i saw his work and also it really kind of 
you know, I mean, I, I studied under a, a sort of a New York school painter as an undergrad, but, you know, and those experiences really got me interested in abstraction, you know, pure abstraction, because prior to that, I really, I wasn't that interested, you know, in abstraction, you know, and more into the sort of surrealist kind of like trippy type stuff mm -hmm. as, as a young person, you know what I mean? But um, yeah. That, yeah, I can relate to that. Um, you know, being there in the presence of, of, of work like that, you know, of, of important work, I think it's definitely could be a very significant experience. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do you remember the, what year that was when you saw that first Pollock in person? I mean, I must have been in high school at the time, you know, probably, um, you know, and then later on, you know, going to going to school and then, um, uh, you know, I studied under this guy, Angelo Ippolito, who was sort of like a second generation abstract expressionist painter, but he sort of like, you know, knew those that same group of people, hmm. uh, Pollock and that whole, whole set of people. Ippolito came from um, Italy, I believe, around you know the time when Mussolini was in power to wow. come to America. And uh, it's funny, you know, they um, I had two painting professors as, as an undergrad, and the one professor um, whose name I'm not going to say, he he, <laughs> he would say, you know, well it's great to be an artist, but if you have the brains to be a dentist, you know, you should go be a dentist, you know? Mm. And then Ippolito always said, you know, Hey, if you want to go, you want to be an artist, you know, go to New York and give it a shot. <laughs> you know, <laughs> So I listened oh, to cool. that guy, Yeah, you know, um, yeah. and I just, I remember he would always be playing Thelonious Monk in the studio and that kind of got me into jazz music and stuff like that too. So awesome. That's fantastic. That is great. Yeah. You know, also through i also thought back like you know having this predilection towards of uh, visual experiences or visual art i in the popular culture what came across to me was uh mc escher and salvador dali because they were you know they weren't you know sequestered inside the rarefied world of of uh more abstract forms they were out in the pop, pop culture mm -hmm. so but i was digging on you know liking uh mathematics and geometry i totally got escher and was fascinated mm. by his uh his work and also um salvador dali of course you know who has hit a lot of universal chords for with surrealism that's mm -hmm. to this day still has an impact uh Absolutely. so so those so those were important influences and um and then as i got into uh studying uh, going to college and going to First, I went to Albuquerque, New Mexico, University, UNM, University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, because I moved out there a couple of years. So that's when I first started, and this was in 76, started taking art classes. So that was about, you know, a year after the Van Gogh, I'm sorry, it was 77. It was two years after the Van Gogh experience. So I go, yeah, I want to become an artist. I'll take, start taking art classes. So that was a, a, you know, a big thing for me at the time. It was like a clarity about my life direction. Uh, but in that, I learned about other artists that did have an impact, uh, Caravaggio, Vermeer, a lot of, you know, the titans of art history, the Renaissance. And I looked at them through a prism of Dali because he liked mm -hmm. Velazquez, Vermeer. And then I also did like the abstract expressionists. I, you know, I liked, uh, of course, Jackson Pollock, Mark Toby. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a French guy named Matthew. I forget his, uh, was, they called him an action painter, but he was very mm -hmm. much... Uh, somewhere in terms of scale, a space between Mark Toby and Pollock. It was kind of a medium scale, but it was very energetic. Hmm. So that component was also interested. But, you know, as art students do, you try out all different things. So I, I was just trying of uh, checking out everything that had come across to me in my uh, studio classes as a kind of uh, compendium of, uh, you know, common practice, if you will, of stuff pulled up from distant history and stuff in the contemporary scene, ways, mm -hmm. techniques. I mean, there's a technique side and then there's the theoretical side mm -hmm. uh, like that. So that was that was an eye opener. That was really good to learn about art history. I, 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 I sort of like history. So the two coming together was very much uh, a galvanizing bit of data or a data mm -hmm. set that was real important. Um, so anyway, not to, because we only have an hour, we could, we could I can, uh, let's see what else do I want to share about all of this development. Um, 
well, some of the I have when we when I share screen, I've got some uh, sort of uh, influences or uh, images that represent my my development in, in the influential stage. So mm -hmm. we'll kind of revisit some of these ideas. Sure. Uh, but that was that was really it. Van Gogh, 75, and then starting art classes in 77, 78, went there. And then I mm -hmm. came back to Los Angeles. I transferred to Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, and that took me to a whole nother level. And that's where I learned about digital in 80 mm. and 81. I, I believe mm. I talked about it uh, when, when I did a share, one of our uh, salons right, uh, with Gene Youngblood's class, and that was yeah. 80 and 81. And that was my introduction to digital. And up to then, I was just traditional media. But when I found out about computer graphics, as I always say, that was the future. That talk about mm -hmm. epiphany. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely very, very early on, you know, in the in the evolution of the personal computer. And, you know, I feel like um, I, I, I felt a similar thing, you know, when at some point, and this wasn't after, until after I had started painting, but I started seeing, you know, I guess it was along, you know, along the lines of what you experienced. You start to learn about the historical context of things, and um, then you see, like, oh, here's where I am in this timeline or this continuum. And like, wow, I happen to have been born right around the same time as this device, the personal computer, you know, or you know, <laughs> it just came into being in my lifetime when I came into being. But artists have been making work for centuries, millennia, you know. Yeah. So, you know seizing the moment you know this is what's happening now in in history is you know humans develop the computer and i i felt a similar thing you know where it was like you know what i think this is the direction i want to i want to move move in you know yeah um, so that's, that's pretty cool what kind of computers were you working with back at that time um well let's see i have to think back but it i really right at the um some of the first access I got, well, the, I took a workshop in 83 because at Art Center, they didn't have any studio classes. It was just the, the survey class with Gene Youngblood. But later, after I left school, I was seeking it out because I, I really wanted to get my some hands on, as they used to say in those days. So at my first workshop was on a was on a PC. Uh, but I, I was minimal hands on, but it was taught by a very erudite uh, pioneer named uh, Frank Dietrich. And uh, he's not as well known as some of the other uh, pioneers, you know, from the SIGGRAPH uh, milieu, but uh, he wrote a lot of important essays, I think in Leonardo and, and, and some other publications. So he, he was programming, it was a programming class and he was using a language called ZGRASS. And uh, so it was, it was just simple programming, probably DOS, uh, you know, just typing in some, uh, parameters in DOS and that and, mm. the, and the software drew simple pictures, but that was mm -hmm. the beginning of it. And I was very well aware. Uh, one of the experiences I had was the, uh, the great disparity between the level of uh, technique that I had developed in analog media at that time. And then the tool set that was very primitive in terms of the mm. kind of images you can make. So that was like this big, you know, a deep chasm of like, wow, you know, I know it's going to be great because I've seen some advanced stuff from the Youngblood's class with uh, like Ed M. Schwiller's uh, Sunstone that was done with, you know, help of computer scientists at NYIT, uh, hmm. for example. So I knew I did get a, a, you know, a glimpse of higher end stuff from that time. You know, that was from 79. So, but anyway, I started in personal computers, but I did get a little bit of a Vax mainframe experience. I went to a place called West Coast University studying with mm -hmm. another pioneer uh, called uh, Tony Longson. He was originally from the UK and he was teaching this class and that was programming too. So once again, mm. you know, it's kind of like, oh, this is fascinating, you know, but the images aren't there yet, but I'm going to just stay with this. And, and then at the same time, and the PC started coming in gradually, a personal computer, you know, I don't know, maybe 80, 81. Right. Mac it, it's interesting that, how you're describing it where um and i remember my i think my very first experience ever with computers was when i was young maybe in elementary school we had apple twos and there was this language logo where you would type in commands mm. and this turtle 
would draw lines and make shapes and stuff and you could make it draw a square or a circle but like you know what what you're talking about um essentially you know is is generative art right you know people are writing code and it makes an image and now like you know with nfts people are like oh this new thing you know generative <laughs> art but it's like the roots of computer art were generative art because nobody had there were there were no input devices no one had wacom tablets or a mouse or any you know a light pen or any of those things that people use you know it was all straight people writing code and then yes. something would come up on the screen you know so it's interesting how like you know generative art now with blockchain is conceived of as like oh this new thing you know but in in reality <laughs> you know, computer art got its start, right, from from essentially generative art in the sense that people are writing code and it generates images. Yes, um, exactly, exactly. Um, so that, that was cool. And I found, you know, being a painter in, in the analog realm, uh, when the uh, graphical user interface came in, and like the paint systems like Lumina mm -hmm. and True Color mm -hmm. Paint, that's was great to see that coming in but i was also first at some point maybe it's the influence of my father in engineering and uh i liked 3d and i saw 3d mm. samples from nyit at young blood's class so i go and i was also interested in geometry and form and polyhedra so i uh the cubicomp got got my notice i, I really mm. focused on the cubicomp which you probably remember from the middle 1980s it was one of the first, maybe. I never got my hand. I, I was I was using a Commodore at that time, but I, probably the Cubicomp was, you know, much more sophisticated. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was a professional tool, like production yeah, houses, yeah. video production houses would buy a Cubicomp. You know, it would be very expensive now. Sure. Not very, you know, compared to what the power now, but at the time mm -hmm. it was a major investment. It would be like, like paint box or those sort of systems, similar to those things uh, network studios would use to create the graphics or whatever is yeah. that kind of like along the lines of what the the usage would uh, be for or what would what well, would they be used for commercially uh yeah you know like flying logos uh gotcha. would be a big thing so they were kind of the uh a, a sort of a little bit more um sort of refined kind of graphical like a lot of those early uh, like 70s uh, electronic things paint box things they were like 2D or 2.5D, the ADO, I seem to remember. So there was a period there, and that was big in the 70s. Uh, but this was the beginning of like uh, 3D computer right. graphics, mm -hmm. but on a, but on a, uh, on a desktop. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. that became accessible. I couldn't afford to buy one myself, but I would uh, you know, go after hours uh, to a production facility where they wanted cool. people to, they were open to people learning after hours. Wow. You know, to, to get like that and uh so i st got my feet wet with that and i i you know i tried to gradually uh sort of revisit the kind of imagery and themes that i was working in in analog media but i knew the tool set was 3d but i like the interface of uh like yourself you know the hybrid of different kinds of modalities of graphics and color field combined mm -hmm. in one image you know vector graphics raster graphics you know mm -hmm. that's that whole spectrum of language you're not just in one little part of it it's so vast that you can find your personal voice amongst this wide you know range of tools and techniques totally hmm. and that was the beginning of it for me like to find you know the, the primitive early stages compared to now like how to find what's your tool set you know Absolutely. kind of gravitating well do you want to bring some oh. um, images up on the screen and kind oh. of like walk us yeah. through i mean uh, i know we had a yeah. question about process but i think that might even be best explained through you know illustrated through looking at some images and talking through okay. you know and, and also honestly what i've found through the course of this project you know in terms of text expressionism in general is i'm always more interested to hear about the the content versus the shop talk of how it was made <laughs> you know i mean you yeah. know that's i think of interest from sort of like a geek standpoint yeah but you know as a, as a human being and like an artist to me like to really learn about what the work is about and i know that that for me at least is much more difficult to even know 
what what the truth is you know i <laughs> especially with abstract work i don't really necessarily know where what it's about or where you know where it comes from it's it's abstract you know but it comes from somewhere you know but i think that um that would be the other half of that question is the process but also you know what is the work about and and that's something that that you know i think is is actually the story you know it's it's at least as yeah. interesting you know I, and especially I totally... to the lay person who you know <laughs> isn't oh, going to yeah. appreciate all the intricacies of you know vector versus raster or all those sorts of things it's like wow what what is that you know um, <laughs> yeah yeah i could see that and i totally agree ultimately it's the ideas the concept the feeling the content that that gets across and will make a work you know be relevant across decades into the future mm -hmm. you know totally. resonate with meaning and i think with technology based work i think so much of the conversation becomes about technology that a lot of times you know it becomes tiresome you know where you know it's sort of like okay so let's forget about the fact that a computer was involved with this like let's talk about the image you know or how it came about or what's the story behind this picture you know what i mean like um because i think sometimes you know uh the work isn't about technology necessarily you, you know it technology is a sort of conduit you know for for the ideas but but in the end you know is that what the work is about or is it happened to have been made with technology based tools because that's what's available to us you know what i mean oh, absolutely yeah i totally agree with that that's um uh important uh to bring into the conversation uh and really yeah the audience of of uh the non-geek audience is that they're responding to the, the other stuff and uh they're not may not be privy to exactly how it was done but if they get meaning from it uh, totally that's the important thing and yeah. the, that connection you know where i think that like a lot of times and that was another sort of aspect of um like for me what inspired me to get going on this project and when, was seeing that other people connected with this idea of text expressionism in the sense that um you know the conversation could be about something other than the computer or digit digitality you know what i mean it could be about oh this piece is about some traumatic experience that i had when i was a kid or this piece you know what i mean like it's it makes it uh you know you remove that component from the conversation and then a lot of times it's a much more interesting conversation because it's about you know the humanity of it you know yes yes absolutely yeah so right. uh, i so, guess should i go ahead and share screen and yeah absolutely flesh this out with some images sure uh, thing okay cool i have sort of like a okay sort of like a slideshow here that I'm just uh, some ping files. And uh, as I have mentioned before, you know, I'm getting ready to I'm just sort of in the finishing stages of uh, a book project that I've been working on for three to four years and wow. um, be called Acevedo in context, which is a career survey from 77 to 2020. And it starts with my uh, early influences and uh, the development of, of my work goes through the development of my work from analog into digital across that time span so in that these i've uh pulled some pages from the book uh that will be coming out as part of this presentation and uh, so this is the first thing i'd like to share uh is uh in 77, as I mentioned, my first trip to Europe was in 75, and that was really a game changer for me. But then uh, the next trip was 77, and it was like a car trip through Spain. We we're kind of uh, revisiting the uh, pathways of the Acevedo routes in Spain. And uh, we went to the Alhambra, and I was interested, well, the Alhambra is known, you know, inner, you know, it's very famous for a lot of reasons. Uh, and but one of my avenue into understanding the Alhambra was reading about M.C. Escher's influence. I mean, uh, his interest in the Alhambra in Spain, which is in Granada. Uh, those of you who are not familiar, I encourage you to to Google it. But it's world famous, really. Um, 
anyway, so at the Alhambra, uh, I had this experience. It was another epiphany. Uh, they had these portals where you were overlooking the city, and that's what this photograph is here on the left. That's my brother, by the way, David Acevedo. Oh. Sadly, he's passed away in 1986, yeah. but he was three years older than me. I'm sorry uh, to hear, hear about oh, that. Sure. Thanks. Um, so anyway, yeah, so he, we were there together and with the family and looking out over this portal, the patterns, you know, the one of the things about the Alhambra, it's like this encyclopedic uh, collection of, you know, of all this sy symmetry patterns, all kinds of different fascinating patterns. And you could see how M.C. Escher would be interested in that. So he did sketches. He went there with his wife and he would do sketches. Uh, and you can, if you read his books, you'll, you'll hear about this and see they reproduce some of his sketches that he did with his wife. But he added recognizable forms like birds and fish, but the underlying symmetry patterns are the same. And this, this moment for me, uh, there was glass like in front of the portal. So I guess, so small children wouldn't fall out because those, you see those crossbars, they were pretty wide, you know, so a small child could crawl and, and fall down. So they had this safety glass in front of it. But what it did is it reflected the, uh, the symmetric pattern over the, the image of the city below. You can see the buildings. And it, mm. this image doesn't really give it uh, justice, but it was so vivid and so clear, this superimposition of periodic space division pattern over recognizable uh, objects and things was it's kind of in one in many ways one of my prime metaphors for my work you'll see an overlay of pattern on figuration this was the 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 birth of that uh sort of uh birth of that metaphor for me that graphical metaphor so that's i wanted to start with that and uh, so, and I was just very new, uh, you know, as I was saying, I started uh, my first college level painting and drawing class in 77, uh, maybe earlier that spring, this was in July. So the next thing that happened just a few days after this, uh, just by chance, I'm, we were in uh, Salvador Dali's hometown in uh, Cadiz. No, I'm sorry, in Figueres is his hometown, but he, at the time he lived in Cadiz. And uh, we ran into Dali, you know, I met him, I shook his hand, you know, I was wow. just like tripped out. Like that was like, for me, it was like, you know, dropping acid, you know, in a good way. <laughs> it was like fantastic. Couldn't believe it. You know, I didn't expect to see him. I didn't mm. say much to him because I didn't really know much about him other than his work. I thought his work was amazing. Mm. And, uh, but that was, a, you know, you can imagine a year into your college studies, you know, you meet one of your idols. Wow. Uh, so that, that was like, a, that just spurred me on. That was a galvanizing experience and just a affirmation. Yes, I am now on the right path. Hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it was that kind of thing. It was just that this deep feeling and excitement and euphoria that I had after the moment. And it was only a brief kind of moment. Uh, we, he said a few things, but, you know, we share that for another time. But that just meeting him and being in his presence was amazing. So anyway. Um, Wow. Two years later, uh, you know, I found out M.C. Escher had passed away in 72. And uh, so just seven years later, his work was uh, being archived at the M.C. Escher Foundation, which was part of the Gamintil Museum or the General Museum in The Hague. So on another European trip, uh, I went there to the foundation and I got per special permission to look at his artifacts. Here's a photograph of me at that time, 1979, holding a wood block from his piece called Smaller and Smaller, which is one of my favorite pieces of all images of all time. It's very much a Mandelic hmm. kind of image. And it's made up of these interlocking lizards. And, uh, and it was a it was a woodcut, you know, his, his images, the craftsmanship on his work is just awesome. And um, I also, and part of the site, they gave me permission to look through his notebooks, which hadn't been published yet. 
Wow. That happened later, but I was able to make, I didn't know how he made these zoomorphic tessellations. So I made, I went there every day for eight days, all day, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. what an amazing uh, opportunity. And I was making hand transcriptions of his zoomorphic patterns, his sketchbooks for a lot of his patterns. And hmm. I saw how they were built in, in graph on graph paper, which wasn't really apparent in the Escher books that had been published up until that hmm. point. So I was able to unlock uh, that uh, that technique of a zoomorphic tessellation. And, and then so my early student work was exploring that. And this is a piece called uh, Fourfold Rotational Wasp. And, uh, you know, it's Escher-esque because um, mm. I allowed, one of the things I did is uh, allowed the interstitial shapes to remain in the zoomorphic patterns. Hmm. Uh, I, I released the parameter of having to toggle between, you know, uh, foreground and background. Uh, but this had, a, you know, abstract form in it. And this was a, a piece that's sort of a combination of various schools of 20th century art, you know, allegorical surrealism, you know, the uh, periodicity of M.C. Escher, and then the, uh, this kind of hard edge minimalist. It's soft because it's graphite, graphite, but mm -hmm. it was after the, those kinds of works, you can see, uh, you know, Joseph Albert's this square here. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Mm -hmm. Yes. And those kinds of things. Uh, all the painters that worked with large polygonal form and they were working with color field. So that mm. worked very well as a kind of uh, creating an environment for the subdivisions that then became zoomorphic. Mm. Uh, you know, the interlock, the underlying form of the, this wasp pattern is a square. Right. And, you know, uh, so that fits in perfectly with the minimalist square and, you know, the Joseph Albert's subdivisions. That kind of thing, and then of course the use the heavy Dali influence was there. Um, it's interesting to see the all of your different influences sort of converging in the in this piece, you know, to see um, just the the patterning from Escher and sort of surrealist like you know elements kind of integrated. And, and could you explain what zoomorphic, the idea behind like what a zoomorphic <clears throat> pattern or what that means? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, uh, it's like simply an animal form, mm -hmm. you know, like a zoological form uh, is basically what it is. And sort of like abstracted in, in, to turn into like a pattern or a repeating sort of tiled form or something like that? Yeah, there's two aspects, like the zoomorphic is the animal form, but yeah, it's... Uh, it's applied or implemented in this uh, peri periodic symmetry uh, mm. pattern. Mm -hmm. uh, like these are, uh, if they have a fourfold rotational symmetry, you know, it goes gotcha. around like that, you can see it. And then they gotcha. also interlock here, there's a two, a two uh, 2D, I'm sorry, a twofold symmetry here. Uh, Let's see if I can zoom in more. So yeah, there's all these sy sy symmetry patterns that Escher, he made zoomorphic patterns for all, there's 17 uh, planar symmetries that exist. There's a finite number. Uh, and uh, so I was learning about that. There was a book called by, uh, I forget who it was, but this uh, famous crystallographer, McGalvery, I believe was her last name that came out, I think in the late sixties she knew Escher and she was, she kind of put across this uh, scientific paper showing that all the symmetry patterns and properties that were uh, extant in Escher's work. So, um, and zoomorphic, yeah, go, go ahead. And, and just quickly, like, um, could you sort of explain briefly what tessellation means? Yeah, tessellation is, is another sort of generalized term. It comes from like, I think the, the Latin term of tessera for tile. So it's mm -hmm. like this tiling, you know, you could think of gotcha. a, che a checkerboard um, like uh, floor tiles. Okay. You know? uh, so that's where that comes. Like uh, tessellation is just the general name for tiled patterns. And I could, see. Yeah, there could be squares. It can be hexagons. And not all, there's this concept of all space filling tiling and not all polygons can do it. You know, you have squares, uh, you have triangles, but those quickly become hexagons. Uh, 
I think those are the main ones. Uh, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I can just go to the next slide. Uh, so, and the reason I'm sort of hovering on uh, this analog media work is these concepts informed everything I did later in digital. Gotcha. And, it, and because it was mathematical, because it, the symmetry operations, you know, these are things that came easy. They were natural to the language of computer graphics because right. it was built on mathematics and geometry, either 2D or 3D. Uh, so that kind of like uh, presupposed me to like realize, yeah, if I'm interested in this and this new tool set has appeared on the horizon, this is the future, you know, of, of doing this st style of work and exploring these ideas. Art mm -hmm. and geometry is with this tool set because it can do way more than uh, with analog media, for, at least from my vantage point. So these are studies, and I and I kind of emulated Escher's workflow. You know, he would make the patterns independent of any particular picture. He would develop the patterns first, and then he would insert them into a composition that might be more figurative or uh, narrative in nature. Though, for those of you who are very familiar with his work, uh, even though later his patterns in and of themselves were published in a book. Uh, so, but I would do that first is develop the patterns. And I didn't do a lot of them because I kind of, you'll see that I moved through this period. Uh, but what I, what, what I enjoy looking at, I'm zooming in here, this one on the left, you can see these color graphic marks. So you could see this was this, I was doing this in the, the time of uh, neo-expressionism. So the color graphic mark, ex expressive mark was coming back into, fashion, if you will, after mm. a, a time of heavy minimalism and, you know, reducing, eliminating the artist's hand, you know, mm -hmm. the neo-expressionists were saying, no, we're doing figures, we're bringing back, you know, the expressive, uh, you know, gesture or brushstroke. So these mm. marks on a small scale, you know, the Mark Toby-like scale. So I like the idea of combining uh, different schools of art, if you will. So, you know, something Escher would never do is you know, he did, he did have, not to say he didn't have some expressive market making. He, he did in some of his early prints that had to do with landscapes. You look at some of his marks, they're amazingly expressive, but they're done in a very systematized way uh, mm. to create modeling, you know, uh, shadow, light, and mid-tone, that kind of thing. But anyway, that's there. You know, you could see it's easy, be easy to talk about, <laughs> spend too much time on any one of these. But I had this other transition then is flipping from polygons to polyhedra. You know, there's all space filling polyhedra, which are the tessellations, but there's also all space filling. I'm sorry, I think I said that wrong. There's all space filling polygons, which are 2D. And there's also all space filling polyhedra, which are 3D. And these are not exactly all space filling, but these do show you how clusters of particular polyhedra can be grouped together in a periodic uh, domain in this in this uh, situation uh, they're in a cubical domain mm. uh, but there's a relationship between these non-cubical polyhedra and the archimedean solid of uh, the icosahedron there's they're clustered there's four of them inside this larger cube and, and they're each one's inside of its own cube and these are down here below our pentagonal dodecahedra so there's this whole interplay, uh, you know, I was fascinated by that. And that was the logical next step uh, in, in my interest in Escher. And Escher was also into, those of you who know his work uh, pretty deeply, you'll know that he also was getting into uh, polyhedra and he included some, some of that in his, his images. And here's an example of sort of an expressive drawing use, using, uh, the, these polyhedral ideas and you, know, you can see these clusters inside these cubes. So, uh, so there's an example, here's a uh, detail of a painting um, that I, that's using this all space filling polyhedra. Uh, and there's various ones, I forget the name of this one, but it has a cube because to fill all space, what one of the, when you study that that a field of all space filling polyhedra, you'll see that there's different combinations of them. You can combine 
cubes with other kinds of forms and together they fill all space. But if you just, if you didn't have the cubes, you'd have gaps there, for example, and that's what this is using. And this is the 2D uh, zoomorphics, but abstracted uh, juxtaposed against the polyhedra. So, so that what I just showed you was an image from about 82. And so I was a fine art major at Art Center. I was studying painting and drawing, analog media. And I've told this story before, but I just want to touch on it briefly. The next giant or big massive epiphany was seeing Ed Emshwiller's sunstone that Gene Youngblood showed in class. And this would, I uh, encourage, anyone to Google Sunstone inside of YouTube, and they have a couple of versions of it. It's the same version, but a couple of different uploads of this animation. It's only, a, I don't know, maybe a two or three minutes, but it's seeing that it was created in 79, seeing it in 1980 and 81 was, was just uh, uh, life-changing. Uh, you know, it was like motion painting, uh, but it was conveyed via video. You know, I never had seen anything like it this computer graphics. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, this is similar to those that kind of uh, paint box and ADO kind of uh, imagery. Like you have these planes, imagery happening on polygonal just squares that are, that are uh, suggesting this cube, but they're all animated. These faces are, are animated when you see it. Uh, you know, it's simple animation, but it, it's all in motion. I think this cube rotates and it goes into some live action at the tail end. It's a fat, there's so much in this piece. It's like amazing. <laughs> hmm. uh, so anyway, so that was 8081. And I talked earlier about getting early access in 83, 84. And then I got access to the Cuba comp and paint systems like true color paint. So an early one of my earliest images was this, uh, just it's a freehand uh, Lumina paint or true color paint image uh, done on a target board. This is the same image zoomed out. That's a close up, and then that's, and it does have a figure, but I think the most interesting part of it is here. You know, I was just realizing, you know, in referencing what we were talking about is, even though these are analog media, I'm still talking about the, the technology of it, you know, that the mathematical thing, you know, I guess that's, for me, that's what's exciting about it, it right. certainly has a feeling, mm -hmm. it means something, you know, because I'm using the language of abstractionist and expressionism as it was conveyed graphically through Pollock, and some of the, you know, the gestural what, abs. What abstract. year were these images from? This was, an, this was from 85. Gotcha. So it has a, you know, and for me, it was just a, like a study. So I didn't mm -hmm. get behind this as a body of work, but it was just finding my way. I'm still learning the tool set. Um, so um, later, I also started getting into Buckminster Fuller and studying his books, uh, Synergetics 1 and 2. And I, anybody interested in geometry, I highly recommend looking at these books. And I used to, uh, before I bought this is in Synergetics Volume 2. Uh, this is a color plate in the back of it. And uh, uh, this was a revelatory image for me. Uh, to have this polyhedral form nested in this uh, matrix of, um, it's really made up of uh, tetrahedra and octahedra, but it's like this uh, spatial net. So it's, it's a... Uh, all space filling polyhedra, but uh, indicated through only its their edges and mm -hmm. openings. So that was kind of a metaphor. Another thing I was interested in was I had been reading about uh, the, the Tao of physics by Fritz of Copra, and he talked about the void plenum and the void matrix. So it was sort of like this field of reality the substrate of reality, if you will, from which all form emerged from and all form, you know, receded back into. Um, so I was thinking as a metaphor for this field could be uh, an all, a matrix of all space filling polyhedra in, in vector realized in, in a vector drawing. And this is an analog media drawing, uh, but this played right into what computer graphics could do.
mm -hmm. could build polyhedra, can do vectors, etc. Uh, so this is an 8384. Uh, I built my own model, the, the two here on the right of this uh, IVM or is isotropic vector matrix, as Fuller would call it. And this a friend of mine, Russell Chu, uh, he built this out of toothpicks, which is an amazing uh, structure. Wow. Uh, so I would use, I used his image in his, uh, a photograph of his model in an image. And then I also used a photograph of my, this model here, top right. You could see it here. Uh, this is a pencil drawing. This is from 83. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, I'm on parallel tracks at this point in my career. You know, I'm beginning to study primitive, you know, pardon my terminology, you know, simple early computer graphics that I had access to and, and then doing these drawings. I was on these mm. two tracks, but I was one, I wanted to close the gap and be able to do something of this complexity uh, in, in computer graphics. I knew that eventually I would be able to, uh, if not literally, just a certain, you'll see it's a certain reminiscence of, of this kind of idea, but you could see that, you know, how that building that model, photographing it, projecting it on this paper, tracing it and combining it, interfacing it with uh, figuration. And there's that uh, vision from the Alhambra, the overlay of periodic space division overlaid on people and things. Right. So that's that's that metaphor that comes back. And, mm -hmm. and then it's echoed. This is from uh, 83. So go ahead 11 years. And here's a, from 1994, a digital piece combining photography and uh, computer generated uh, models done with a soft mm -hmm. image. Here's that overlay. Mm -hmm. It's not, uh, you can see this is called suit on the phone. Uh, hmm. So this echoes, uh, this is another piece. Uh, it actually has that wooden styrofoam and wooden dowel model, but kind of tweaked out with some with a filter distortion filter and then it's hard to see here i'll zoom in a little is a complete completely synthetic geometrical structure that's kind of like interfaced with these so i like the idea of bridging these various realms because that that played into this this notion of the metaphysical you know the void plenum and uh other things i was also in the late 70s reading carlos castaneda books so I had this uh, notion of non-ordinary reality and, be, and the notion that you could actually see it if you were in a mm. particular frame of mind in a particular vibration, you could actually see the world as it really is, or at least another version of it. And these pictures in, in a sense for me are illustrations of that uh, kind of seeing Mm -hmm. seeing the scene of everyday life as we normally see it, but also seeing the uh, invisible energetic ocean that we're, that our human drama is happening within. Mm. Uh, yeah. So that's kind of the, that's the, the metaphor that comes here and there. I'll, I'll pause a moment because if you wanted to ask a question or should I just carry on or? No, that's it's really interesting. It's sort of like the um, you know macro and micro view, or you know looking into the the invisible structure of things. It's like you know, and it's it's also kind of cool to see how your ideas cross between traditional and digital media in terms of pencil drawings and computer graphics. And I can very much relate to that. Um, you know that that sort of idea in terms of uh you know i feel like you know using a different part of your brain when you're rendering something by hand with a pencil you know and sort of like while you're one part of your mind is sort of occupied doing that activity you know <laughs> you're it almost forces the rest of your your brain or your mind to be you know doing something else you know what yeah. i mean um so it's it's interesting and it's interesting to see how the ideas translate between the different um, types of media that you use, you know. Uh, 
Okay, so yeah, so here's that metaphor again. These are, and I wanted to show it different images than what I showed in my, uh, you know, share during the salon. Mm -hmm. But you can see. But I wanted to kind of highlight uh, as you as you were uh, seeing is that relationship between analog and digital media, and the ideas how they transfer and how they kind of uh, come up. Are What's the general uh, time frame for these ones? This is also 94. Okay. Uh, yeah. And uh, so I was getting kind of looser with it, you know, like here's the first stage of it. And I'm using the same geometry that I was using here, but I apply it in a different scene. And this is mm. a scene of everyday life. And it, and, uh, but, you know, in the happening within the energetic ocean. Right. Uh, I mean, I think that the juxtaposition of the photographic imagery and the renders is is really kind of unique and it, it makes your work speak in a different way that um you know it questions what is what is digital art or what is computer art i remember you know like when i was going to grad school it was still called computer art they'd yet yeah. to start calling it digital art you know um but like you know then you see well there's a table with a guy and, and beer bottles and stuff so <laughs> you know like um it, it sort of, it, it shocks you into, oh, there's, there's reality there, you know? Um, and it's, it, I, I think that's one of the things about your work that I think is really interesting is that kind of interplay, you know, between the, the rendered forms and photographic content like that. Um, and what, what is it that makes you that like, uh, you know, um, what what drove the sort of selection of the of the photographic imagery or is there a sort of story behind like why you chose the the images you chose for that component of the work yeah that's a good question you know uh, a lot of my work is is bi biographical in a way mm -hmm. so this is actually a photograph of my brother david who you saw uh in that picture from 1977 in spain and uh this is from 83 and he, you know, he, and I met, but the photographs from 83, but the images in 94. So he had passed away in the intervening years in 86, just three years mm -hmm. after this time. So it was kind of a, you know, a, a tribute to him. And also mm -hmm. this feeling of, uh, for, for those who've lost a loved one, you know, that how they're always with you mm -hmm. and, and that uncanny, uh, experience of you know they're on the other side there's mm -hmm. someone else somewhere else and you had this connection to them but they're in now they're in you know in the eternal energy ocean somewhere mm -hmm. their spirit is can be localized through resonance through synchronicities and such they're always so it's a it's kind of you know it's a tribute to him sort of being in this other realm, but, and, but it's, and that other realm is a, you know, a gradient into a memory that was concrete in the real world. Mm. Uh, so that's, that's a story behind this one. And he, you know, my brother's a sub comes up a few times along the way. And then other people that I know, uh, you know, this has a particular uh, relationship to living and not living, but the metaphor can be used for people that are still very much alive. You know, we're all in the energy ocean, whether we're here or not here. Mm -hmm. uh, Do you find that working with, um, you know, abstract sort of geometric images, like the the sort of overlaid forms when you were putting these pieces together, did it help you in terms of, you know, maybe not even help you, but like, did they stimulate, did, did, did cre the creation of this work sort of stimulate ideas that are, you know, like the ones you're talking about, how, you know, we exist in an energy ocean or like, you know, when you're putting these pictures together, you're also creating thoughts in your mind about the nature of physical reality and, um, you know, things of that nature, you know, like in terms of using art itself is sort of like a tool for abstract thinking. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And, uh, and in your question, you kind of touched on this uh, sort of phenomenon such that just about on every one of my pictures, if not all of them, I don't set out 
to, to sort of illustrate a particular idea, I just kind of intuitively put these things together mm -hmm. to have a charged composition. Because I do think in terms of uh, comp compositional resonance and, and compositional harmony, you know, mm -hmm. I could, where I would place this and how the geometry interlocks with the photographic space that's already right. been mapped. That's real important that the, the abstract geometry actually connects in a, some kind of perceptual logic to the right. photographic space. A kind There's, of a formal compositional component to the work that has to be there for it to, to work for you as an image. And then, you know, there's all the underlying ideas. Yeah, so, exactly. So there's that, that's kind of a long, that's sort of what's it, present of mind while I'm doing it. But then later I'll, I've had this experience many times is only later I realized what the picture's about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> totally, I completely relate to that, you know, like <laughs> absolutely, you know, and not sometimes it's years later, you're like, you know what, that's what was going on in my life at the time. And now I understand why I made something look the way I did or why I chose the imagery that I did. You know, um, that's interesting that you say that because it really reminds me of something that happened to me when I was in a critique in grad school where people I was sort of getting grilled by another student about, well, what is, what is your, this work about? And I was like, it's about the process, you know? And she was like, that's not good enough. You know? <laughs> what is it, what is it really about? And I was just sort of at a loss, honestly, I did, I, couldn't answer the question you know there I was I was making it and I was in some sort of a zone where I was solving a visual puzzle by the compass through the compositional process but at a deep level I I didn't really know what it was about it wasn't preconceived you know in that way um, and maybe that's what you know makes makes art different from design you know in, in a sense you know in some ways you know yes exactly I'd agree or illustration you know yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, uh, so um, just to jump back now, uh, a little a little kernel of chronology. Uh, so that was 94, but I want to jump back to 87. So this is early on in my uh, computer graphics, uh, you know, career, so to speak. Uh, so this was, you know, like four years in and you could still see the uh, MC Escher influences with the zoomorphic mm -hmm. uh, patterns and also the Buckminster Fuller influence with the great circle uh, overlay. And then I also had, you know, I always had this sort of like playful surrealist edge to things. So I, this is my favorite image here, but mm. I also like this, like just some kind of like crazy version of it. Same, mm -hmm. same elements but just kind of done in sort of yeah, a really sort interesting, of, you know, that how the treatment represents references technology, you know, in the way that the image is, is constructed or the way that the, the sort of figurative components are, are, are rendered, you know, um, but it, it also looks very modern, you know, in the sense that um, I don't know, there's, there's something about these, these pieces, and then knowing the time frame they're constructed in, uh, that makes them pretty pretty remarkable. Um, you know, to see uh, work being done at that time that looks like this, um, really really pretty cool. Cool. Thank thanks. Thanks so much. Yeah. So here's uh, another version of it. So the idea of versioning and using the same uh, you know figures, uh, same environment in many different ways, because I was just exploring what the tool set could do. But each mm -hmm. one of them has their own personality. Mm -hmm. uh, they bring out, they have a different message, even though it's the same characters. Right. And it seems like a lot of your, uh, it's, it's what's, what's kind of um, interesting about your work to me is that a lot of the, like the scenes that are depicted are sort of like, mundane every day it seems like you know just kind of like a day in the life of you know of you like something that's just happening not not a big dramatic occurrence or it might be just people hanging out 
sitting having a cup of coffee together <laughs> right. in the kitchen or something like that. And that's, um, you know, that's, I don't know, I, I think that's interesting and it makes the work um, feel very sort of genuine, you know, and um, like taking a little moment, you know, and kind of expanding upon that. Yeah. Uh, th thanks so much. It's a uh, very, um, I mean, a lot of that is conscious to, to uh, have everyday life, you know, like with Vermeer and some of Velasquez, uh, some of his lesser known paintings were, were moments in, every, in everyday life. Mm -hmm. So they, it's not used that often. It's more of an art historical term, but the, the, fray, the term the genre scenes, scenes from everyday life. Uh, is 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 a conscious uh, component of of this figurative work, mm -hmm. and because uh, I I feel that's what's ha really happening. You know, we uh, what our everyday moments, everything we're doing, from the smallest to the largest, to just to stay alive, to to uh, elongate our passage, you know, through this moment of our lifespan is is happening inside this energetic ocean so it's it's for me it's in it makes sense to combine the two everyday life mundanity with this like otherworldly you know beyond extracorporeal or beyond human uh scale or consciousness but uh mm -hmm. expressed graphically you know uh as we as we can do with graphics. Graphics are, when I say graphics, I just mean as a general category of, uh, I guess as a verb and a noun, as a, as a kind of a, a language for, mm. for, for basically energy pathways. We can use it for, I use it in a literal sense on that, on some level, but even if you're just trying to do, make something realistic, there's the energetic, a graphical component that's being uh, basically uh, imprinted onto the page. It could be by mm -hmm. hand uh, like that or, or by machine. Uh, this one's called, uh, this is another, this is a good example of later finding out, you know, deciding what it means or what it's, what am I going to call it? And this is called the last supper. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. and it's just uh i've done that a couple of times naming a piece after a famous uh art historical work but well, this mm -hmm. is people around a dinner table but it's the the natural the, the first hit of it is all of this kind of chaotic jumble but if you look look again you'll see that the jumble is created by uh you know an orderly pattern an orderly right. array of these forms but just kind of jumbled together uh so how are we doing on time? We, um, we're doing okay. I think, you know, um, you, you wanted to show a video um, towards the end of the presentation as well, right? Yeah, I did actually. Yeah, but I'll show. Uh, we're, I'm getting towards the end here, but I just wanted to, yeah, uh, get a, a, a check on that, on the time thing. So something I'm doing now, I know one of the questions was, you know, so what am I doing now? You know, how, what's the development of your work? And what are you doing now? And you know, I we talked about the NFT uh, world. So, and uh, so I've been kind of dabbling in that. And one of the things I found is since I've been focusing on my book and I've been focusing on my personal history, uh, I haven't really had time to make brand new images from scratch. But I've been kind of like looking back at some of my older images and kind of uh, revisioning them. You know. And, and putting them into the NFT uh, space. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, sorry, I got distracted here. It's getting a text message. So towards that end, so here's an image from 2006, uh, figure in the void matrix, a uh, friend of mine, uh, Kevin O'Connor. So mo most of these images are people that I know are friends. Uh, so, that was the original one of the original versions, and then I revisioned it into uh, this wider symmetry, uh, or what? Yeah, it's still bilateral. Now it's bilateral symmetry. It's twofold. 
but uh, you know I duplicate the figure and then uh, there's this version too, which is a more expanded panoramic version. Uh, so one of the things I found is, you know, when I did this originally in 2006, I thought that, you know, I was happy with this. That was great. And, but I'm liking these new versions more. I think the meaning of the image comes across more. Mm. Uh, originally, uh, this was called Kevin in the field, mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, the, in the uh, structural energetic field. Uh, so there's that. And then I did that again with another piece called uh, Escher Girl uh, that was shown at uh, Giovanna's uh, show in Williamsburg that she mm -hmm. put together just recently. I had this print, but this is the original version from, uh, I think, 2002 and uh, revisiting it with uh, bilateral symmetry. And I, I, I just I like this a lot more. And I added mm. this uh, sphere in the middle. I think the meaning of it or the power of the image is enhanced in this presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's kind of so as a transitional phase, that's something I'm doing uh, is, is kind of re-looking at some older images and seeing how I might. Totally. Uh, I, I could relate to that too. Uh, the first NFTs that I minted were really taking you know old digital drawings from you know 99 to 2004 that were vector based and then um animating them and adding audio and kind of bringing them into motion and i think part of it was like you know um what what is an nft right it's it's really just a way to um you know sort of publish work in a sense or you know there's yeah. no inherent sort of real formal qualities to what constitutes an nft so it's like you know to, to connect it back to previous practice i think makes a lot of sense um in a way you know and i think it's such a new medium people are inventing new new ways to, to you know to sort of leverage it or, or use the idea of an nft but i think that you know connecting it to past practice um, you know, it's definitely something I can can relate to. And I like the way that these images are constructed in that, you know, they have the symmetry, but also you're adding in this central element, which breaks the symmetry. And that makes it a much more interesting composition, you know, formally than if it was just a straight uh, symmetrical treatment, you know? Okay, yeah. That, yeah, I agree. I agree. It's uh, that's been also, a, I think, a reoccurring thing as pattern, but then the broken pattern, mm -hmm. broken symmetry. Interestingly mm -hmm. enough, I'll zoom in a little. That uh, pencil drawing I showed you called fourfold rotational wasp is here in the background, mm -hmm. right here. You can see it. Uh, hmm. It's uh, this is actually a photograph taken at my first uh, public exhibition in 1982, and hmm. I, I was showing uh, analog media works. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a nice, so there's this loop I find, you know, uh, it could just be my age, you know, like at a certain state of life, you start, you know, revisiting, uh, what you've done in the past. And it, it, there's these correspondences, mm -hmm. uh, that make it fun for you. And they also imbue it with, it might be personal, uh, biographical meeting meaning, but, mm -hmm. uh, there is a there are correspondences that could work on a formal level um totally totally yeah i definitely i mean i relate to your work in a lot of ways you know for, for myself like i i also have a body of work that incorporates photographic content in it and it's all pictures that i've taken through the years that personal experiences and things like that you know so i think that you know uh, i definitely like was influ influenced by people Rauschenberg or Warhol, who you know used photographic imagery in some you know some sort of conjunction with technology in the sense that they use silkscreen, but um, not appropriated imagery, you know. And then I, I relate to like you also using not non appropriated imagery. It's personal imagery that's biographical in nature, you know. And that that to me is much more interesting, or at least you know it's something that is is yours and it's a piece of your life, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, I did early, you know, when I was working analog media as an art student, uh, just kind of learning my craft, 
I did appropriate images, you know, that was also sort of a Warholian uh, gambit, you know, to just appropriate images and make, put them in a new context. So I did mm -hmm. do a little of that, but I kind of quickly wanted to make my own uh, photographic images if there was going to mm. be a, you know, photographic. Yeah, there's more meaning, more resonance, uh, I think, for for the artist and maybe on some subliminal level, the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or if they know it, then they can kind of vibe with that. Yeah, it gives, it gives opportunity for more layers of meaning and more resonance. Mm -hmm. uh, taking it out of this, the, yeah, I totally agree. It's amazing as we're talking, I knew we had a lot of uh, sort of synchronous uh, sensibilities, but as we've been talking this afternoon, it's like there's even more and more, it's kind of kind of cool. Yeah, it, it is <laughs> cool. It's like very, you know, I mean, I relate to like a lot of what I'm seeing in terms of, um, you know, the treatment and the ideas, but also sort of like the, you know, the the experimental spirit of the work. I think that that's, what keeps me coming back to the studio is I'm hoping to find something, a surprise at the end of the day, you know, you know what I mean? Like sort <laughs> yeah. of um, not just executing something that, that I already thought of, you know, uh, to, and it's, and I find, you know, definitely with working with technology and these types of tools, especially when you see that progress bar slowly crawling across and it's like, <laughs> what is it going to do? You know, um, that's, that's kind of, you know, a lot of fun uh, yes absolutely uh that element of serendipity and the surprise of your collaboration with the tool set mm -hmm. uh is also and you're guiding it and then you know we see, we see more advanced forms of that with uh a uh practice with ai mm -hmm. uh, uh tools or apps uh but that that uh, kind of collaboration with what the computer computer vision or uh, the sort of the autonomy of computer rendering or machine imaging is is an extent already even before AI apps there's a certain com element of that absolutely yeah so um, I guess I'll jump to uh, my video but because another part of this uh, let's see I guess close this out Is that working? Yeah. Oh, thanks. I'm glad that worked that time. I think it was just a hiccup in the sharing. Gotcha. So if you yeah, wouldn't no mind worries. editing that one out. And yeah. I putting that in. I appreciate I it. Do that. Cut that piece that, out. That would be cool. Um, so, yeah, we've gone a good amount of time. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, just sort of in closing, um, and this is something I always sort of ask, um, you know, when I when I do these interviews, 
what is it that that you know interests you about tech expressionism or um you know um well first of all i i was curious how you initially found out about um the project and then you know what's your sort of take on it or what does it mean to you because i think that that's something i'm always interested in in hearing from individual artists sure yeah um well you know i found out about the group through raj diamond who i knew from my new york days in the you know in the middle 1990s Mm -hmm. and uh she collected you were in a show that um she curated right i wasn't actually in the show but i did attend it it was called code okay and it was a group show it had nina sobel and it had char davies who was doing a vr piece it was really advanced for its time she she worked Mm -hmm. at soft image it was really an awesome awesome piece so i met i think i met uh raz during that time she was a curator of the show and she was aware of my work, but I think we may have also been in a group, group together, uh, ASCII, Art Science Collaborations Incorporated, which was hmm. a, a, a nonprofit group uh, that's still in, in existence today. They have a Facebook page. Uh, they're a very interesting group, pretty much New York based. But hmm. um, so I knew, so Roz told me about the Tech Pressionist group. And when I looked at it, I was seeing, you know, I saw the salons, the watched a few of those and I read uh, uh, most of the uh, manifesto kind of thing. I just need to go back and read the, the rest of it, but I read enough to go, wow, this is cool. I, I thought it was really, really very uh, sort of uh, protean, if you will. It was, it was, it had a lot of uh, potential as a way, as a concept, as a term that kind of encapsulate this whole sort of field of practice, the use of uh, using, uh, you know, I think of it as computer graphics, but it's all technology. That's what's one of the good things about the term. It's more generalized and that's good art history terms to have that kind of uh, quality that they can, you can include a lot in, in them, in that, under that moniker. And the idea of, uh, you know, the use of technology to express, to make an emotional statement or an expressive statement, that uh, juxtaposition I thought was very, uh, very smart and very accurate to where really what's going on. Because we're using this, these, these tool sets that on one level produce all the same you know, sort of kinds of effects or kinds of structures, but they're, they're unique to every practitioner. I guess kind of like mm. a, uh, musicians and musical instruments. Mm-hmm. You, know, you could think of the guitar. You know, there's all the way a guitar can be played across time or even in the contemporary space based on the musician themselves, what they bring to it, that expressive quality of their touch, their technique. Uh, and that's the same way with these digital tool sets. So there's it. So the term tech pressure, tech expressionism encompasses that and i like it also echoes back to you know expressionism and all Mm -hmm. the forms of that you know uh, the original expressionism i guess the german expressionists and then the abstract expressionists because they were bringing in abstraction non non non-objective form as they used to say uh and then there was neo-expressionists so there's this history of this thread through art history with expressionism and uh, so that's pretty cool so you're combining um it, it, it's a really smart and inclusive term that really encapsulates uh, this field of practice. So I could really see it catching on, uh, you know, and, there, and it doesn't make other, for, other terms obsolete like digital art, but it's a kind of a way of like, there's the idea of, you know, I don't know if the analogy would be painting and, uh, you know, modernism. Right. You know, there's this interplay between those two levels, you know, uh, uh, that kind of modernism or neo-modernism and all the different flavors. But there's the, the technical component to it that also roots it in a kind of his, uh, practice, whether it's sculpture or painting, you know, it's mm-hmm. computer graphics. Yeah, or- I mean, part, you know, part of it, honestly, the I mean, the the term itself was sort of like, you know, it came to me when I when I first thought of it as like, well that's an interesting portmanteau of, and and the way that expressionism to expressionism it just sort of flows phonetically but part of it also was that 
um, you know, especially when I was in graduate school, I saw the way that the undergraduates uh, students and they had actually transitioned for the bachelor's de degrees to be called digital art and Patrick and myself were still MFA computer art students mm -hmm. that the department hadn't changed the name of the program yet. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I saw that the, the area of interest for the undergraduate digital art students primarily was commercial applications like working in gaming, um, 3D motion graphics for, for like outfits like Pixar, you know, like really um, kind of mass media applications. When, when people talked about digital art, it was like, you're gonna go out there and get a job in digital art working for a studio or working for a software company or oh. a game company, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so when people would talk about, they said, well, is that, is that work here is digital art? It never really satisfied, <laughs> like I never would, I never felt 100% comfortable describing it in that way, you know? Um, so it, it sort of, you know, resonated with me and then seeing that when other people connected with that idea um, and then seeing artists like yourself, you know, were, you know, it, it's interesting to see that, that you find a level of identification with the idea also. So that's, that makes me, um, that, uh, you know, that makes me feel good that there's, hopefully you know legs to it and uh i think that you know um yeah th there's a there's a there's a lot of sort of facets to it but it's interesting also like the reason i ask this question is it's it's an open-ended thing at this point you know it's really it's not a word yet it's not <laughs> in any <laughs> dictionaries hopefully you know that my ultimate goal would be that it'd be brought into common usage you know versus becoming some sort of a an organization or any sort of other entity, you, you know what I mean? Even though it is a group and a community, you know, I think that there's there's different aspects to it, but I think that um, it's interesting to hear the different perspectives from, from different people on, on, on what it's about. And um, I mean, one thing that I think was really, really an important moment in, in the development of the idea was that, um, Helen Harrison, when we had our very first salon and we were talking about, you know, the goal of bringing the term into common usage, she said, you know, we were, we were working with a definition where it was an artistic style in which technology is utilized as a means to express emotional experience. And she said, you know, what do you guys think about switching out that word style with the word approach? Mm -hmm. And that that really made a you know even though it might not seem like that big of a difference i think that makes a huge difference because then it's not about all the work having a similar aesthetic or having a you know a particular visual treatment the way that say glitch art might be something where it could be recognizable as glitch because there's sort of a, a you know a very sort of set um range of visual treatments that might be defined or define that particular genre or type of work. Whereas, you know, I think thinking of it as an approach versus a style um, is what allows it to be so, uh, you know, something that, that a broad range of different types of artistic practic practitioners can identify with, you, you know? Oh yeah, um, that's so. an important distinction that that subtle distinction is real important. It really opens it up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, something, you know, when I write, as I use the term expressionism in my own notes or, you know, I find that uh, I'll abbreviate it privately as a tech X, huh. <laughs> and, you know, nice. like ab ABEX, you know, and uh, so okay. I just thought I would, I've been wanting to mention that to you, you know, I'm not pushing it in any no, way. No, that's, but, that's but pretty Tech cool. X, it's a, it's a way of shortening it and it could become known if it becomes a, a thing, you know, an adopted terminology, Tech X could be the sort of the, uh, the cool abbreviation version of it. <laughs> right on. <laughs> nice. Nice. Very, very, very cool. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's definitely, um, something I haven't heard before, you know, and uh, it's certainly a lot easier to say ABEX, you know, versus abstract expressionism. Although, you know, I think that 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 abbreviation when someone says ABEX, then they know, oh, that person kind of knows what they're talking about because, <laughs> you know, they're using the abbreviated version already, you know, but yeah. tech X, I like that. That's pretty cool. 
Oh, okay, cool. Nice. Glad, glad you liked nice. it. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I guess, you know, we're, we're kind of um, around that time to, to wrap things up. But um, so what is just for the people who are watching and listening right now, what is your website? Uh, it's uh, acevedomedia.com, and it's my last name, A-C-E-V-E-D-O, media.com. That's my website. And you could go awesome. just Google my name, Victor Acevedo Artist or Digital Artist, and you'll see a lot of links. And I have a YouTube page. And uh, Fantastic. And when is the book that you're putting together slated to um, uh, be made available? It's, it's going to be a kind of a rolling start, but I think in the spring, it'll be should be available for uh you know pre-order knock on wood it's going to be a gradual thing because there's this sort of pre-launch phase that i'm learning about i want to try to get some reviews in mm -hmm. things uh so then when it really launches it's uh we'll have you know a bit more notice people will notice it a bit more so gotcha. but it, it'll start becoming available maybe even in uh on electronic form by spring and then but it's it will be a, a uh a uh, hardcover book initially uh it's you know it's it's a small modest edition self-published be an edition of 2000 that'll roll out you know 25 50 at a time kind of thing mm -hmm. fantastic That's, thanks that's awesome well looking Appreciate forward it. to it and thanks so much for um you know uh, sharing your time with with me today my, my pleasure colin it's been a great honor and great pleasure to to share this time with you and to have an opportunity to talk about my art, my work, and uh, really happy to be part of the Tech Depressionist group. Tech X, I like Tech that. Tech X, That's yeah. Very yeah. cool, very cool. <laughs> All right, Victor, right, cool. until until we meet again in um, cyberspace or, or the metaverse, as you know, it's- Yes, <laughs> absolutely, <re> <laughs> yeah. I had some other things to talk about for future movements. We could save that for another time, but yeah, the metaverse, what's, the, what's in the future? The metaverse and for future of art and the future of culture. If we if we can if we can keep planet Earth will be good if we can keep it. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> Let's knock on wood. Yeah. All right, Victor. Well, until next time. Yeah, it's great. Great to see you, Colin. Likewise.